Hi, this is Mark Birch, and today we're going to be taking a look at Act 1, Scene 2 of Macbeth. One of the things that's important to realise is the way in which Shakespeare has structured the play in order to manipulate our appreciation of the character of Macbeth. Act 1, Scene 1 associates Macbeth with the witches. They say they're going to meet with Macbeth, presumably linking him to evil. However, Act 1, Scene 2 completely subverts our expectation of the character of Macbeth. Macbeth still doesn't appear in the play, he doesn't appear until Act 1, Scene 3. But here we have this different narrative perspective on the character of Macbeth, provided by the captain, who the king immediately establishes as someone who's reliable. He's a bloody man, a testament to the fact that he served his army well, he's covered in blood because of his heroic deeds, and he's described as both good, hardy and brave, all positive qualities, and yet this person is the one to cite Macbeth's goodness, bravery, honesty. One of the first things that the captain says about Macbeth is that he is brave Macbeth. Well, he deserves that name. Employing the epithet brave uh, to essentially show that uh, this is a defining characteristic of Macbeth. An epithet is essentially an adjective that characterises someone, a bit like um, the Great Gatsby or Grey-Eyed Athena. Here, Macbeth is defined by the quality of bravery, it's his essence. The captain's description of Macbeth in the battle highlights two key characteristics, his bravery and his violence or power. Um, in terms of the bravery, we have, of course, the epithet Brave Macbeth, but then also um, fortune and valour are both personified as virtues that Macbeth either rejects or is the vassal of. Um, when he's described as disdaining fortune, fortune is personified as a prostitute who had been supporting the rebels. But Macbeth, in the face of overwhelming odds, fights against that fortune, that destiny, in order to pursue the leader of the rebels. And like Valor's minion, suggests that uh, Macbeth is himself the servant of bravery personified. He's the living embodiment of bravery. Shakespeare employs particularly vivid imagery to capture the violence and power of Macbeth on the battlefield. His sword is described as having smoked with bloody execution, capturing the extent of the bloodshed in the cold Scottish air and the way in which it smokes along the blade. The verb carved conveys the skill of Macbeth because he's able to destroy his enemies using the precision used normally to cut the flesh of animals. And finally, Shakespeare captures the relentless way in which Macbeth kills MacDonald. He doesn't chop his head off, he doesn't cut him down in a conventional way. He sticks his sword into his middle and cuts him in half, unseamed him from the nave to the chaps, from the navel to his jawline, literally splitting him in two. The captain describes a fresh assault that's uh, brought about by the Norwegian lord, and Duncan understandably wonders what the reaction of Macbeth and Banquo was to this. One would imagine that they would be dismayed. The captain's response to this question is couched in really confusing grammar, so we've got to get our heads around the fact that uh, when he says, he has sparrows, eagles, he's saying that Macbeth and Banquo are the eagles, and the rebellious army are the sparrows. So just as eagles wouldn't be daunted by sparrows, so Macbeth and Banquo aren't dismayed by the opposing force, despite it being a renewed and replenished force, because they're so brave. And this zoomorphic comparison is complemented by a second comparison. This time, Macbeth and Banquo are the lion, and the hare are the rebels, clearly weaker, clearly lower down the hierarchy in the great chain of being, establishing the superiority of Macbeth and Banquo and their bravery in the face of what would seem to others to be overwhelming odds. The violence and power of Macbeth and Banquo is emphasised still further in the simile as cannons are charged with double cracks. It's the idea that just as a cannon would be loaded with gunpowder, if you charged it with twice as much gunpowder, it'd be twice as powerful, twice as dangerous. And here, Macbeth and Banquo are charging at the enemy with twice as many attacks, twice as many blows, twice as powerful. And to really drive home the point, the captain describes Macbeth as having doubly redoubled strokes upon the foe. With that lexical repetition of double, complementing the description of that relentless assault of Macbeth and Banquo. 
A final way in which the captain conveys the horror of the battlefield and the extent of the violence that had to be perpetrated by Macbeth and Banquo in defence of their king is uh, the verb bathe, as if they meant to bathe in reeking wounds. Now the verb connotes the extent of the bloodshed because it would have to be deep enough uh, for someone to bathe in, metaphorically, um, so blood up to the knees, but it also connotes potentially pleasure as well. Um, Macbeth and Banquo aren't appalled by what they're doing. In fact, the opposite, because what they're doing is honourable. They're doing it in support of the king. And finally, really finally with this, um, it could be said that they're trying to memorise another Golgotha. This brings to mind the image of the crucifixion site in Jerusalem, where inevitably the ground would be covered and seeped in blood from all of the crucifixions that would take place there, again conveying the extent of the bloodshed at the hands of Macbeth and Banquo on this battlefield. The scene ends with Duncan giving the honour of the Fane of Cawdor to Macbeth, and it's interesting structurally that uh, the epithet noble is given by Duncan at the end of the scene, echoing the epithet brave that was ascribed to Macbeth at the beginning of the scene. Also, Duncan couches this in antithetical parallelism. What he hath lost, noble Macbeth hath won. And we can hear the parallelism through the he hath lost, Macbeth hath won. And perhaps that antithetical parallelism conveys the reversal in fortunes for the Fanes. What the original uh, Fane of Cawdor lost has now been given to Macbeth, a reversal in fortunes echoed in the reversal of the parallelism. Okay, top.